Hello. I do hope you're all staying safe and sane as the rules are slowly changing about coming out from lockdown. I think it has all been particularly confusing for children. First, it happened so suddenly. Almost overnight, they lost school, friends, playing out and a firm social structure. And the worst of it was that there was no foreseeable end to it. The worst hit were probably those about to take GCSEs. Everything they were working for just stopped. It almost seemed that everything that they had worked for came to nothing. Possibly as long as six months of life at home with no aims and no friends to meet. At least those who would have taken A-levels could still go to university. But what kind of university? Lectures online? Social life curtailed? Many are not sure they want that kind of university life now. So much has changed. Actually, I have great faith in the ability of most human beings to adapt to change. But maybe it's particularly hard for many children and young people because they've not had to adapt before. It just seems to them that the world has suddenly become an uncertain place to live in where they can no longer see the way ahead, which is quite frightening. And one of the most frightening things is that there are no rules or predictability about education. Or rather, the old rules have gone and new rules are being put in place, like social distancing and bubbles. And it's the bubbles that are causing great upset to my youngest granddaughter. She's been put in the wrong bubble. Annie was looking forward so much to going back to school and completing her final year at primary school. Obviously, it wasn't the schoolwork she was looking forward to. It was being with her friends again. Annie probably isn't the most gifted as far as schoolwork goes, but I think she does have a gift for friendship. And from her first week in reception to these last weeks in year six, she's been part of a group of four girls who've stuck together as friends through thick and thin, standing up for each other when necessary, helping each other, as well as playing with each other after school and having sleepovers at each other's houses. Now, in the other classes going back to school, their form teacher has created the bubbles of about six children in each who will not mix with other bubbles in classrooms or the playground. And form teachers will naturally put friends together as far as possible. But the form teacher of Annie's year has recently left on maternity leave. So the head teacher has done the bubbling in alphabetical order which is perfectly reasonable, but very unfortunate for Annie, as it means that her three friends are all in one bubble and she is in another. At first, she thought she could change it. She wrote to the head teacher, explaining how distressed she felt and asking him to move her into the other group. In hindsight, her parents probably should have done that, but they thought that since she wanted to, then she should do it. But they did see her letter and thought it was quite reasonable and humble. Anyway, she was absolutely outraged when the head teacher rang her parents rather than writing back to her and just said no. The bubbles were made and there was no changing. She then wrote to the governors, if you please, confident that they would see her point. And she did at least have a reply from the chairperson himself, but just to say that it was their policy to support the head teacher. Well, said Annie to her parents, there's no point in going back to school, is there? Her parents didn't make her go back last week, 
but they did show that they understood and felt very sorry about it and suggested that she really should go back in the next few days. Rules were rules and even if they didn't suit her, children should obey the authorities. Annie took it badly. Another factor that she realised was that she, if she were in another bubble to her friends at school, then she should not be able to play with them out of school either. Luckily, the situation was solved when one of her friend's parents invited her to have a socially distant play in their garden. It was actually raining when the time came but this parent had put up a gazebo in the garden and the other three friends came too, each sitting in a corner of the gazebo and giggling and making up games like in the old times. Annie did go back on Monday and is doing her best to adjust. But she said, I do think relationships are more important than rules, don't you? Well, personally, I always have felt that, and actually I think Jesus did too. Or at least he would have said that love was more important than obeying rules. The Jews had the law which governed many aspects of behaviour, and one of these was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. In other words, claim compensation for in injuries such as makes up for the injury. And said Jesus, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And about disputes, he advised, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court, rather than go through the outward legal progress, process of court justice. For courts are about legal rights and wrongs, guilt and non-guilt, and punishments, usually leaving ill feelings which can persist for a long time. Jesus did not preach legal justice, he preached love and forgiveness. And the ultimate teaching was, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. This is well nigh impossible without Jesus' help. And if we ask for his help, then we must have the will to forgive and the will for reconciliation. But it can work. I always remember saying something to another member of this church, which I'd meant as a joke, but which offended her deeply. I could see she was upset and immediately apologised, but she was still too upset to really accept my apology. I spent a sleepless night wondering how I could have been so tactless and praying about it. The next morning when I met her, she grasped my hand, thanked me for my apology and said of course she forgave me. And I'll never forget the sweetness of those words of forgiveness. They went deep into the relationship between us. That was pure love. Well, Jesus' words don't work where hearts are hard and only legal justice will suffice. But at least we can do our part to try to reconcile and to ask Jesus to help us love and forgive. Going back to Annie, who was so upset and frustrated, she might have accepted the head teacher's verdict if he'd handled it with some understanding and love instead of standing on his authority and just saying no. Then she might not have taken it to the governess, which was a big mistake. But if only they'd said something like, we're sorry to hear you're separated for you, from your friends and ask you to try to understand that Mr. Rayner has had to make decisions in very difficult circumstances 
and we hope you can accept this. If they'd only accepted how she felt instead of pushing the head teacher's decision, she might have been mollified. But that would have involved some degree of humility from both authorities, which is hard to come by. But at least it's something we can take on board, trying to see the other's point of view, however unreasonable it appears, and putting this over in a sympathetic way. Hurt feelings can turn to resentments and bitterness if no understanding is expressed. Jesus was not against law, he was just against obeying it outwardly, like the insistence on the ritual cleansing of eating utensils or the ritual cleansing of hands, whilst ignoring their own inner impurities. His command, or law, was to love as he loved us. All social institutions, including schools, or especially schools, have to have rules to ensure their smooth functioning. But even hard and fast rules can be applied with love, understanding, and possibly explanations. And the funny thing is that if there's a loving relationship between a figure of authority, like a teacher and a child, then the need for rules almost disappears. The child wants to obey the teacher because she feels loved and loves back. Jesus obeyed his father even to the point of dying on the cross because he loved his father. And Jesus wanted us to love and obey. He said, those who love me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Let's have a few words of prayer. Dear Father, thank you for creating us with the ability to be flexible and to adapt to difficult situations. When we come up against a brick wall, help us to stand back until our emotions have calmed down and then turn to you and ask you to guide us into creative ways round the wall. And if people disagree with us or if they feel angry with us, Give us the compassion to accept their angry feelings and to try to see their point of view and to explain our position in a loving way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, when we have been wronged or treated unjustly and there's no attempt at reconciliation from those who've wronged us, help us to follow your advice, to turn the other cheek or walk the extra mile willingly. And if anyone is really against us, don't let our hearts be hardened. Help us to step away and pray for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus, your teachings are hard and we sometimes find it too difficult to love. But we do love you. Help us to love you more that we'll not only want to love and forgive, but we will receive your help to do that. We thank you that you come and make your home within us. Lord, 
Let me face life, not on my own, but together with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and always. Amen.